All right, everybody, welcome back to the Introductory Astronomy Lab. This is going to be the third lab of the semester. It's going to deal with the force due to gravity, or the gravitational force. All right, so to give you guys a brief history of the force of gravity, there are two prominent scientists that helped develop the, uh, the force of gravity work. They kind of stand out. There's been a lot of scientists over the centuries, but these two in particular have made major contributions. So the first one is Sir Isaac Newton. Now, when he came up with his three laws of motion, he also did some work with gravitation. And basically what Newton posited is that gravity is dependent on the mass of a body. The more mass of a body is, the more gravity that that object has. So technically, I have gravity just like the Earth has gravity. Only the Earth, since it's so much more massive than I am, it has a lot more gravity. And he had an equation to kind of calculate the force due to gravity. And that's defined as F, or the force due to gravity, is equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, over the distance between the two objects squared. And with this equation, you can calculate the force between any two objects. G is just a gravitational constant. It's equal to 6.674 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared over kilogram squared. That's a mouthful. But basically, if you plug in that G, the M, the first M, which will always be in kilograms, the second M, which will be in kilograms, and the distance between them in meters, you can get the force between any two objects. So for instance, as an example, let's erase this really fast. Let's say you had the Earth and you were standing on top of the Earth. Whoops. All right, your mass would be M1, the mass of the Earth would be M2, the distance between you guys, or yourself and the Earth, would be the radius of the Earth, and you would just plug all that in, plug the G in, and you would get the force between, or the force between yourself and the Earth. Now, one interesting thing that this equation implies is that when you jump up off of the Earth and you put a small distance between the two of you, the Earth is pulling you down to it, and you're actually pulling the Earth up to you. Now, the, di the difference in mass between the two of you is so great that the Earth moves very, 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 a very, very, very small amount, but it still happens, and that is pretty neat. Now, in the pre-lab for this lab, we're gonna use that equation to calculate the force between some planetary bodies. So I'm going to go ahead and draw up another example between the Earth and the Sun. So let's say you had the Sun right here, and the Earth over here. Sun would be M1, Earth would be M2, and the distance between them would be R. And just like between yourself and the Earth, you would just plug it into the equation, and you would get the force between the gravitational force between the Earth and the Sun. Now there's a couple other cool concepts that we can calculate when uh, kind of look into based on Newton's law of gravitation. The first one is centripetal acceleration, and that is the acceleration that a body experiences. Like let's say we have the Sun and the Earth. That is the acceleration that the Earth experiences as it goes around the Sun. That will always be directed inward towards the Sun. All right. And the other thing that we can calculate based on Newton's laws of gravitation is the orbital velocity of any object when it's rotating around another. So for instance, the orbital velocity equation is equal to the square root of g over the mass of the more massive body over r. Okay? Now in our Sun-Earth system, again, the Sun and Earth this would be m, because the sun is so much more massive than the earth, um, the mass of the earth kind of drops out as far as the orbital velocity is concerned. In the pre-lab, you'll, uh, you'll have to answer this question of the orbital velocity of the earth around the sun when the earth is at its farthest point from the sun. Okay, so that's a basic introduction to Newton's law of gravitation. In addition, Einstein also came around, and around 1915, he came up with the general theory of relativity. 
And the general theory of relativity is a major kind of break or expansion on Newtonian gravity. Newton said that gravity was dependent on the mass of any two objects. That, you know, if you had a lot of mass, you had a lot of gravity. If you had a little mass, you had a little gravity. Einstein expanded on that, and he said that we, our universe is actually composed of space-time. And it's actually a massive body warping this space-time that causes gravity, not the mass itself. So if you take the Earth, we'll go back to our Earth system, okay, and there you are standing on the Earth. You feel the force of gravity due to Earth because the huge mass of the Earth is warping space-time and kind of creating a 3D indent in space-time. And you're pulled, or you fall, towards that indent. All right? And this is a very powerful concept. A lot of our technologies, like GPS, um, a lot of our, any sort of location or satellite tracking depend upon this principle. In fact, we can't even calculate the orbit of Mercury without this principle. And it has a lot of interesting uh, ramifications to it as well. For instance, if you look at general relativity and Newton's law at the same time, you remember that the force due to gravity between any two objects is Fg m sub 1 m sub 2 over r squared, right? The distance between them. So let's look at a bigger system than you on top of the Earth. Let's look at the Earth and the Moon. So we have the Earth here, and we have the Moon here. And in space-time, it kind of looks something like this. Right? Maybe maybe a little more of a slant, like that. So the moon and the Earth is still in the gravitational field of the Earth. In fact, that's why it revolves around the Earth where it does. The moon has a specific orbital velocity, and that allows it to orbit in one path in the warped space-time. But you can also see that as the distance increases between the two bodies, gravity, the steepness of the space-time curve, gets a lot less extreme. And so the gravity, the Earth's pull on the Moon is a lot less than, say, if you were kind of hanging out over here in space. Even though it's an R-squared term, um, it, gravity can never go to zero. So even if you were super far away, like maybe another galaxy all the way out here, you would still very, very slightly feel the force due to gravity of the Earth, which is pretty neat. Now, another concept in uh, the laws of gravity is the fact that the force due to gravity, or Newton's force due to gravity, while that is dependent on the mass of an object, the acceleration due to gravity is not. So again, going back to our Earth system, we have our space-time kind of bent around. That space-time indent, that falling, if you're on Earth, you know, you're kind of sitting in that space-time wall, is causing you to accelerate downward. That acceleration is going to stay constant. But the force that's produced, if you go back to F is equal to ma, will actually be increased because your mass is increased. So remember, acceleration due to gravity is always constant. The force due to gravity changes depending on the mass. All right, so how does this relate to our lab? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a simple pendulum system and we're going to determine the period. Now, in the lab report, I had you guys use a paint stir and a protractor, and you can do that. Essentially, you can set this up however you like. But one way that I found this pretty handy is to use a tripod for your telescope. Kind of set it up like this. All right, have the protractor here so that you can measure, oops, so that you can measure the degrees that you offset the mass, all right? And what you want to do, once you attach your protractor, we want to see that the period of this mass, which is determined by gravity, doesn't change no matter how massive the object is. All right? So first, we want to calculate what the period should be. So T, the period, is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum over gravity. Okay? And as you can see, there's no mass in here. So no matter if this is a thousand pounds or a pound, it's not going to affect the period that this swings between, um, that this swings. Now the length of the pendulum is just the length of the string down to where the mass is attached. So it's just this length. 
When I made mine, it was about three, five meters, but you can make it however long you want. I would try to stick close to this though. Also, if you want to save this string, don't get rid of this because we'll need it for next week's lab, um, Kepler's Laws of Motion. All right, so what you want to do, once you, oops, once you calculate your period, right, you say you'll get about two seconds. So T will maybe equal two seconds, all right? We want to experimentally verify this. So you're going to choose period for mass one, period for mass two, period for mass three, and see what you get for each one. Now, each of these, if we perform the experiment correctly, should come out to all be about two seconds. And how you want to do this, or the easiest way that I think to do this, is make sure your protractor stays on there. And you want to lift it up about 10 to 15 degrees. You don't want to go much beyond that, because then you have to use a different equation for period, and it gets kind of, kind of tricky. So lift it up about 10 to 15 degrees, and count how many times it goes back and forth in 20 seconds. So one full uh, wavelength would be one, two, three, four. And you want to see how much that goes back and say 20 seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever you want. And you'll get your frequency. That'll be your frequency because that is cycles over time, right? And then the period is equal to one over the frequency. So once you calculate this, just plug it into here and you'll get your period. All right, so go ahead and try this experiment out. You can try three different masses. Um, I would use the included ring in the lab kit at first and then you can put anything that works on there that's small enough, um, any, you know, just a different mass of object. Make sure you take a picture of your setup and answer the questions in the lab assessment and have fun guys. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next week.